Good evening, Fernwood. My name is Neil, and thank you for joining me on my 325-day path through the entire series of Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. It's been a long, strange trip, and it's going to get longer. So, we are heading into the March 24th, 1976 episode. There were two major plot points covered in the last episode, so I'll take a look at those, and then let's just do a brief recap of some of the other storylines we didn't see, just in case they come up. Last episode, the two major storylines are this. Mary is trying to get Tom to get some help in terms of the sex with a sex therapist. Of course, neither does Mary understand what a sex surrogate does, nor does Tom know that he is being approached by a sex surrogate. He and Mona McKenzie have a rapport that has been developed, but you know he doesn't actually know what's going on. So... It's a little bit sketchy in regard to that. I want to talk a little bit more about Mary and Tom's relationship after we do the recaps. And the other storyline is that Loretta is emotionally shook because of the call from Charlie's ex-wife, Muriel Haggers. She's still a mystery character. Charlie would rather avoid Muriel, and Loretta is just afraid that Muriel's going to shake up their relationship. Those were the two parts of last episode, so let's go through a couple of the other storylines that we have seen. Tom is running for union officer at the factory. They make car parts, I figured out. George is in conflict with him, even though George is no longer on the ballot. Uh, but Tom is hoping for some support from George. Charlie got work at the factory again. Hopefully that will work out well. and. Kathy is now seeing Dennis Foley. That makes me a bit uncomfortable because Dennis Foley is still obsessed with Mary even though he is going out with Kathy. So we'll see if that comes up today. And you know, I did say I wanted to touch on Mary and Tom's relationship. It really is central to this series. So I've had a chance to look at it a bit and I've got two things I want to point out. One, based on the conversation that he had with Mona McKenzie, I start to see that Tom and Mary actually have quite a lot in common. They both feel that they are failing at life to put it to words, that Tom definitely uh, longs for the thrill of being the star athlete in his team, and he no longer has that. And at work, you know, he's looking for meaning there. And Mary has lost all sense of meaning and that's similar and i wish they understood that about each other i wish that they could see past their own emotions to look at their partner if there were two things that i wish that they could say to each other one would be if mary would just say out loud tom i am not having as much pleasure during sex as i would like to have that would be immense. Just that one that one thing there. Now, of course, they'd have to meet in the middle and work together towards improving their sex life. But that that's something that I really would want to see instead of the stuff that she is doing. And then Tom, I think Tom definitely reacts with impatience towards Mary. I think in some ways because, you know, conflict is more interesting than not when it comes to stories. But I would like to see... Tom take in some of the try to take on a point of view of Mary I think both of them need to have more sympathy and empathy for each other even if they it is clear to me that they love each other but they don't really feel sympathy or empathy for each other in a lot of the cases they, 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 they're almost adversarial at times I wish that they could mend that and I think that that's something I hope for i don't expect it to happen because i get a sense that this show is gonna get darker but that's what i'd like so that is my uh look at the series so far of mary hartman mary hartman let us begin the march 24th 1976 episode right now <laughs> Mary Hartman! Mm -hmm. Stop 
Charlie, you really like me? Charlie. Leave me be. Leave me be. You're having a dream, honey. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's just a dream. Probably not. <laughs> It's all right, honey. That ain't no nightmare. Oh, baby, come Charlie, on. Charlie, wake up. Come on, baby. Wake up. Huh? Up and at him, Buster. Huh? Huh? What is it, honey? What's the matter? So that's your story. So that's my story what? I heard what you were saying. What are you, I'm just supposed to lie here and take it? Take what, honey? What's, what's, what are you talking about? You mean what I'm talking about? I'm talking about, oh, Mary, a little baby. That's what I'm talking about. I was dreaming. I know you was dreaming. Uh, what was you dreaming about? Well, let's see. Oh, there ain't no let's see about it. You was dreaming about Mira. You was dreaming about your first wife. I heard you calling her name. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. I, I was dreaming about this little puppy we had when I was a kid. Oh, expect me to believe that? I expect you to believe it because it's the truth. We had this... See, when I was just a little boy, they gave me this beautiful beagle puppy, and I called her Muriel. And then when I met Muriel Fawcett... Oh, that was her last name, Fawcett? Yeah, that was her maiden name. Anyhow, she was the... First one named Muriel I'd met since I met the pup. Well, I didn't actually meet the puppy. I mean, they gave it to me. And then, then I put the two names together, see? And then they both run out on me. Damn, I sure did miss that puppy. And you didn't miss Muriel Fawcett, your wife? Hell no. As a matter, as a matter of fact, I was dreaming about Muriel Fawcett. And that was what led me to dreaming about Muriel. The puppy. Well, that practically explains it, but um, I never heard anybody calling a puppy old baby. I didn't. Charlie, I heard you. You said old baby. Well, that was you, baby. Me? Yeah, see? It was like a dream, see? It's like one of your, you know, dreams get funny. I mean, like, see, first of all, they're was my wife, Muriel Fawcett, chasing me with a pack wrench. And then there was Muriel the puppy biting her on the leg. See, and then Muriel the puppy started licking my face and my hand, and then, then suddenly there was you mashing up chunky tuna for my lunchbox, sitting right there, right on your side of the bed. Was she prettier than me, Muriel, your wife? Oh, honey, not by a long shot. Muriel the puppy might have had an edge on him. <laughs> Damn, I do get off a good one every once in a while. Every once in a while. Honey, the real, the real dog among my Muriels was Muriel, my wife, and I mean dog, too. What about me? Why was I in the last part? Well, honey, that's because you were in the last part of my life so far. I mean, like, first there was... Muriel the puppy, and then there was Muriel Fawcett, and then there was you, mashing up chunky tuna, which you know I love so much, and just tickling me pink. Well, and you saved the best for last, see? I mean, you, honey, not the tuna. Well, are you sure you was dreaming about Muriel and not dreaming about her because you still want her? Well, sure, I still want her. But that puppy's long gone by now. I mean, your other wife. I know what you mean. I'm just pulling your leg for ever thinking I could want anybody else except you. But she is on your mind. I can't help that. Yeah, I suppose not. I mean, I suppose if somebody that I once loved called me out of clear blue sky after 15 years, I'd be thinking about them too. Now, that is not what I meant, honey. Honey, Loretta. Muriel is real trouble. I mean trouble. Well, didn't you ever love her? I suppose so. When we first got married. But not, not like I ever loved you, honey. Hell, I was just dumb country boy. I was 27, 28. What did I know? Well, you knew that she was educated, sophisticated, and sexy, and beautiful. <laughs> Married to me? 
And what would ever give you the idea I'd be married to somebody educated and sophisticated? I don't appeal to that type. Oh, thanks a whole hunky bunch. I mean, I appeal to the type which is sweet and sincere and very sexy. Like, like a Muriel, right? No, honey, not like Muriel. That is not what I meant. <laughs> Hello. What? I'll be damned. It is her, isn't it? No. No, no, you sound just the same. Sexy and sophisticated. Well, as a matter of fact, we were just getting up. To Fernwood? What do you mean, don't I want to see you? You damn well know the answer to that one, baby. Baby? What? God. You... Now, it is not a case, it is not a case that Loretta doesn't want to meet you. I want to meet her. I want, I want to meet you, Muriel. I want to meet you. I do. You heard that, huh? Well, I, I don't know. I, well, I'll tell you what. We eat at six, come at eight. Oh, Charlie, that's tacky. Come at six, Muriel. Drink. You know something, Charlie Hagers? For somebody that hadn't thought or cared about anybody in 15 years, he's got an awful lot of emotion going on. Well, it's really late, isn't it? Is it? I hadn't noticed. <laughs> It's, it's amazing how, how when it's late, it turns into early. You're really <laughs> Something terrific. like that. <laughs> Thank you. Mary! Mary! What, Mary, what are you doing here? Oh. Did something happen? Kathy, hi. Oh, I must have fallen asleep here. How strange. I came over to um, buy some coffee because, you know, Tom has to have his coffee or high dance. And then uh, I remember there was something that I wanted to tell you, and I went to your room and you weren't there. And then I remembered um, that you were out with Dennis, and I thought, oh, well, she's safe. And then I thought, well, maybe you weren't out with Dennis. And, and then, you know, I got a little bit worried, but there wasn't, and I do have to tell you. So then I just sat down to think for a moment what to do, and I must have fallen asleep. I, I'm sorry. I hope it doesn't look like I was waiting up for you or anything, because I was asleep. It does to me. Mary, uh, what did you want to tell me? Tell you? Yeah, you said uh, you came to tell her something. Could you stay out of the stands? I really think I can handle this myself. Uh, where was I? Mary, Mary, I had the most wonderful time. Dennis and I, we, we spent the whole night talking. I'm so exhausted, I can't believe it. Listen, wait right there. I'll be right back. I have a surprise for you. Then she's only 20 and she's never been hurt the way you can hurt her. Blue is your color, Mary. You look beautiful in blue. Um, my night and I'm just wearing some coffee. And then she's my sister, and I don't want to see her hurt. And your hair. I've never seen you like this before, but I... I knew that you'd be as delicate as, as you are. The way I pictured you. With your hair like that. I never knew how to believe you or not. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? Mary, Mary. Yeah? So when you can't have the real thing, you want the next best thing. And what's the next best thing to Mary Harmon? Kathy Shumway. <laughs> Kathy Shumway. Listen, there's something wrong with that. Kathy's a wonderful girl. She's
She's a wonderful girl and she's in trouble right now. And uh, she needs a friend. I, I just can't believe you could be that kind. I mean, you just don't. You always look so sweet and sincere, and I just can never tell whether to believe you or not. I never lie. You're so sweet. I'm so confused. I know. And I'm sorry. Maybe it's because I keep telling you the truth about how special you are. And you don't want to hear it. Yeah. This is too early in the morning for this, isn't it? Depends on how you calculate time. Oh my god, oh my god. Oh my god, I feel awful. I feel like I'm doing this awful thing. Listen, she's my little sister. I mean, she's suddenly so complicated. It's always complicated for you, Mary. Things won't change. I'll still see Kathy. What? I never understand. Mary, I had to run the test. It took so long. Mary! God, you can see through that nightgown. <laughs> I'm sure she didn't know I was going to stop by. She just came by to get uh, some coffee from Rutherford to borrow some coffee, and I'm on borrowed time myself. I have to be back at the station in uh, a couple of hours. Uh, well, th don't you want your surprise? Uh, why don't I get it from you later? This evening. Got it. Okay. Dennis, I... Bye. Listen, Kathy, I really have to be getting back because I have to make breakfast for Tom and Ed. Mary, uh, you know, you probably would have kissed me goodnight if you hadn't been here. I really have to get back because Tom's going to make for work. Yeah, and I, I should go upstairs and go, go to bed. Yeah. Probably won't sleep anyway. Uh, see you later. Teeth, 
Mary, could you be jealous? I'm not jealous. Well, he's so cute. And he likes you. I know. He's a girl, Tracy. You know what? In my opinion, you know what they would call him? We call him a ladies' man. Uh -huh. She call him a skirt chaser. That's what you call him. He can't let a girl go by. Anyone. Are you calling me anyone? No, no. Of course not. It's just that Dennis Fowler is more than a red-blooded... What? You should have seen him the day Mona was here. I met Mona. I mean, she was... She was attractive, but he was just being polite. He was drooling. He wasn't. Well, he wasn't drooling then, but his breathing was certainly very irregular. Well, that just proves he's normal. I mean, maybe Tom doesn't react to people like that. Tom reacted. You mean you let him meet Mona? Uh-huh. I wanted him to meet Mona. You mean on purpose? Well, when he met him, I thought that the way that I would introduce them was that he would not know that she was a sex therapist. You are out of your bird. Kathy, don't talk that way. What I thought was that she could treat him. That's all. He will thank you. He will hit the ceiling, and then he will strangle you. You do not know my tongue. Mm -hmm. Underneath that baseball cap and that high school grin is a very reasonable man who has the courage to face up to his problems. Both hands around your neck, twisting. No. And if that doesn't work out, you'll strangle him. Me? Why? Mary, don't you know what a sex therapist is? Kathy, I'm an adult. Of course I know. I mean, I watch television. It's, like it's communication. It is like psychoanalysis. It's like a ticket to your own funeral. Oh, please don't talk about funeral. And I have to leave those feathers. I'm just trying to warn you, that's all. Kathy, she will help him with his performance anxieties. And you don't have any anxieties. Letting Tom meet that gorgeous, sexy woman. Of course not. It's all been discussed. She's a professional. That doesn't even enter into the picture. How do you know that? Because she told me. And, and you believe her. Kathy, I met the woman at the public library. Now, do you think that the public library invites professional liars? Of course not. The public library caters only to the most intelligent people with tremendous integrity. People who read books, or at least take them out. She's lying to Tom about who she is? She's not lying to Tom. It was designed that, that way. This is the way that she and I planned it. She was very opposed to this, by the way. I had to talk her into it. And you really don't think that she'll take advantage of this situation? Kathy, I cannot even dignify that question with an answer. The woman is in the business of mending damaged marriages. She's another woman, and I think that you are asking for trouble. I swear, honey, you have cleaned up this place within an inch of its life. If you scrubbed any harder, you would have scraped the paint off. You really think so? Well, yeah, I wanted to make a good impression, you know? Because I wanted to think that I was a good wife to you and a nice little homemaker and everything. Sweetheart, all she'd have to do is see the light in my eyes and the smile on my face to know that. So you think I did a good job, huh? Good. And you hardly stand up on your legs. It's fantastic. It's a miracle. That's what it is. Look at you, all cute and dolled up. Well, heck, I mean, look at you, Dusty Depp. And what'd you think I was going to do? Show up looking like some old mud hen? I was wondering what you'd think when you saw me in a tie and all. I think that you look sexier and neater than Kelly Savalas with a <laughs> mustache. <laughs> I was afraid that you might think I was doing it for her. Were you? No, I was doing it for you and me. Pick up my own spirits a little bit. You know, I just can't get over this sense of doom. Now, about Charlie, tonight. I want to tell you something, honey. I have been thinking about this, and I have decided in my mind that we are going to try and have a wonderful evening. 
Now, I've been in there just cooking my guts out. I know you have. I know you have. I smell it. It's my favorite dinner. It's fried okra and black-eyed peas and chicken fried steak. Darn. What, honey? What? I can't believe I forgot the chip steak. Oh, Lord. Would you mind going to the store? No, no, no. I'd love to. Oh, and listen, honey, while you're out, stop by the house of pies and get one of those pecan jobs. Now, honey, I know, I know they cost an arm and a leg, but see, if we take the 10 back, then we get 15 cents. Darn, I hope that, I hope she just, you know, doesn't turn up her nose at country cooking. Now, why in the world would she do that? Well, because ever since the day she ran out of Which was the luckiest day of my life. Well, I don't know. She's probably been gallivanting all over these fancy places all over the world. Tulsa, St. Louis, Kansas City. She probably hasn't been any place fancier than just where I'm going now, which is the corner store. Bye. You was first in baby's heart Till you went and slammed the door Oh no. Oh, that, that can't be Muriel. I mean, she, she's not due here for an area. Oh, please don't let it be Muriel. Oh, I hope it's not Muriel. Please. Hello, dear. I'm Muriel Haggard. <laughs> well, that's an entrance. <laughs> So in this episode, we are basically seeing two storylines go off, kind of three storylines. It's Muriel appearing for the first time and all of the anticipation toward that. Can't wait to actually see what she does and what she's all about, other than other people's interpretations of Muriel. I kind of want to get her point of view. I'm just intrigued that way. Then we've got relationship stuff, and that's mostly between Kathy and Mary, although some reflections towards Dennis and Tom. Kathy and Mary's relationship may be just a little bit strained by the difference between Dennis and Mary's points of view. Come on. Laying a kiss down on Mary. Now Mary could have rejected that kiss or, or stepped away from it somehow. She took the kiss and then stepped away and I don't know, it's maybe a minor change, but she definitely felt some feelings that she didn't like. And there was just a little schism between Mary and Kathy right immediately after that, because Kathy was feeling a tad rejected because Dennis didn't kiss her on the way out. And then there's the a little bit of discussion of Mona McKenzie and Tom and we don't actually see Tom in this episode but Kathy has maybe just a little bit more sense than Mary in terms of what is this woman doing uh, now not every therapist that deals with sexual issues does sexual contact like a sex surrogate might but um, I think in the 1970s it was all still pretty mysterious you know most people in America weren't publicly going to sex therapists I think that's something we don't even see that much now so uh, I guess I kind of want to see that one roll out uh, I, I think that Kathy has kind of the right idea in terms of the she's the voice of reason in that situation and I mean not that I encourage Tom to get violently violently angry but I could see it happening anyway that was the March 24th 1976 episode of Mary Hartman Mary Hartman thank you again for joining me and we will see you tomorrow night in Fernwood